and talk, cancer of our dysfunctional health care system. We see in many magazines, the whole business, I can't afford to get sick, a major cause of bankruptcy. We spent $2 trillion for health care in 2005. Will it bankrupt America? It's possible. It's 16% of the gross national product. It's causing major corporate layoffs. Why do we outsource 3 million jobs to other countries? Because it's cheaper to do cost of business there. What is the major cost of business in America? Employees. What's the biggest piece of employee cost? Health care. General Motors spends more on health care than they do on the steel to make their cars. Did you know that? So we have to do something about our health care system. Uh, GM, Medicaid is the highest state expense, $40 trillion in unsecured liabilities from Medicare and Medicaid. We are headed over a cliff in a barrel. Health state of the union, America near the abyss. Uh, we are number one in world health expenses, but uh, actually well down the field by some 34th in our quality of health. Iatrogenic deaths that is uh, based upon the medical system, a, an article in JAMA said that 140,000 Americans per year die from the on-label use of prescription drugs. There are other statistics say it's much higher than that, but it's a significant number. Uh, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, mind drugs, medication, obesity, aspirin, Alzheimer's, hypertension, infections, it's getting to the point where there may be the majority of the people that are sick and there's going to have to be 49% treating them and 51% are in the hospitals. That doesn't look very good. We have to do something else with our time. So we have a little cartoon here. What do you mean you're out of breath? I haven't switched it on yet. <laughs> I believe this is the guy who invented shoe fly pie. So there are many books on the market that you can read about people who are dis in disenchanted with what's going on in our health care system. And they include Overdosed America, written by a uh, medical doctor who uh, teaches at Harvard Med School, who says there are many better ways of treating most of the diseases in this country. Heart disease, diabetes, hypertension. We could cut the cost by 90% if we use therapies that are available, that are scientifically proven, but we're just not implementing it. So there's a strange gatekeeper going on in this country. It's what's prescription, what is medically prescribed, rather than the rational therapy. And this doc makes a compelling argument for that. Overtreated. She says that at least one-third of our $2 trillion a year is unnecessary medical care. Don't need it. We could save that money. Uh, this one is a beauty. The truth about the drug companies. Marsha Angel. Dr. Angel was the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and she came out with a book saying most of the ads and the, and the articles that are in medical journals are unvarnished marketing reports. Uh, there are so many studies that are hidden that, that were negative for that drug. Read the book. You'll find it quite fascinating. So we move on. Not everybody's happy with what's happening. Don't let anything come between you and the foods you love. This is a Nexium ad. I love it. So in other words, maybe pizza gives you heartburn, but eat the pizza, take the Nexium. Doctor, every time I do this, it hurts. Then don't do that. We have sort of an illogical system going on here. Uh, what's, what are we spending our money on? If we go back to 1964, you will see that the red is Medicare and, health, and Medicaid. 1964 was when we started Medicaid. There was zero percentage of the federal budget. It was 9% in 1984. 2004, it was 19%. And it's projected to be larger than all other components combined by the year 2015. So Medicare, Medicaid, could well bankrupt this country unless we change our course. This looks at the effect of cost growth. It's not just aging. The effect of aging and the increasing cost of health care is minimum. The effect of increasing cost of health care is driving most of that. We have just say no to drugs. 76 million baby boomers are about to retire. And that was an interesting slogan back in the 60s. Just say no to drugs. Who knows? So we have a cartoon here. Each, each of them is named after one of my medications. <laughs> and if you count them, there's 11 dogs, and the average senior citizen takes 11 prescription medications. Obesity increases the risk for cancer, heart disease, diabetes, renal failure. It's a major risk factor. We've been through that. The brilliant presenters before me did a great job of covering obesity. But I'm going to show you a slide here that might... Don't step on it, it makes you cry. <laughs> Little girls looking at the weight scale or mommy. 
So this is taken from the Center for Disease Control website uh, in Washington. I want you to watch. You see the uh, 1994. Keep an eye on the dates and the colors. What we have here is light blue means less than 10% of the state is overweight. Dark blue means more, 10 to 15% is overweight. Watch the progression, 1994. 95, we got more blue states. 96, a lot more blue states. 97, some yellow states. Ah, new category here. That means 15 to 20% of them are overweight. More yellow states, 98. 99, more yellow states. 2000, more yellow states. Red states, oh, we got a new category here. That means 20 to 25 percent of the population is overweight. 2002, more red states. 2003. And I believe, along with Dr. Smith, that uh, high fructose corn syrup is playing a major role in this obesity epidemic. There is a huge growing uh, a group of people who have what's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease from high fructose corn syrup. It's not processed well in the body. So we come to supersize me. Uh, the new statistics say that 50% of all uh, minority children, blacks and Hispanics, grown in this country will be diabetic in their lifetime at our current rate of increase. Which brings us to a little uh, video. I'm going to show you this for three reasons. Number one, the force of nature that's in this wave is in us and can help heal us. Number two, the wave of disease that's coming at this country based upon these statistics that I just gave you is unprecedented. We have never seen what's coming. And number three, the patients oftentimes feel alone and wonder, am I going to make it? Let's see if we can get technology to work with us here. Largest wave ever video, 80 foot wave. Biggest wave of disease we have ever seen coming at us. Is he going to make it? All right, he made it. And I think we will too, but we're going to have to use our intellect, and we're not doing that right now. Outline for the talk, moving on here. Cancer as a disease in America. Let's look at some basic statistics. Cancer cases, the big four are prostate, lung, colon, and breast. Breast most common in women, prostate most common in men, lung most lethal in both men and women, and then there are other cancers. Uh, projection of cancer cases, we have now 2,000, there's about 1.4 million newly diagnosed cancer patients per year and it's projected to grow to about 2.7 million newly diagnosed by the year 2050, perhaps sooner than that, who knows. Some people say, well, we have a cancer epidemic because we're an aging population. No, uh, that doesn't explain it all. From 1900 to now, the, increase, the percentage of the population that was over age 65 has increased but the incidence in cancer growth is far beyond the growth curve. So something else is there. Can chemotherapy cure cancer? Ask Lance Armstrong. Arguably the greatest athlete ever lived. Six Tour de France after he used chemo to beat his cancer. Very impressive. However, realize he had testicular cancer, which is one of the few cancers that is very responsive to chemotherapy. We'll move on and talk more about that. Progress Report in the War on Cancer. This is from a recent book by a physician. Uh, War on Cancer, Anatomy of a Failure. Chemotherapy is curative in about 2% of advanced cancer. This is from a board-certified oncologist written in Lancet. Many medical oncologists recommend chemotherapy for virtually any tumor with a hopefulness undiscouraged by almost invariable failure. 
Move down here, this is uh, Eric Abel, who was a biostatistician in Germany who was told he worked for a large cancer hospital. They said, get us data to prove that cancer works. He reviewed the late data. Then he wrote a book, and they weren't happy with him. What he said is, chemotherapy is an eff effective in about 3% of advanced epithelial cancers. A sober analysis of the literature has rarely reviewed any therapeutic su success by the chemotherapeutic regimens in question. And in spite of that, the only therapies we're allowed to use that are reimbursable are chemo, radiation, and surgery. Now, do I bring this up so you'll go back and annoy your boss? No. I bring it up to say those who live in glass houses should not throw stones at others. What they'll say is, oh, this nutrition stuff is not proven. At what level? At what level? Karen did a great job of talking about how much evidence does this say before it's irrefutable. It takes a lot. We're still selling tobacco over the counter. Is the evidence irrefutable? Tobacco users have a lower incidence of um, Parkinson's disease. It's true. Brought up. So anyway, I'm bringing up is, uh, is chemotherapy going to continue to be used? Yes. But it, the data is not necessarily supporting it. Shifting the cancer paradigm. This is from the ASCO Journal, the American Society of Clinical Oncologists. This is the Bible of oncologists. And they said, the limits of the cancer-killing model seem to have been reached. We need to consider cancer as potentially reversible. The killing strategies may be counterproductive. Ke um, remission does not predict cure. And finally, this I've got down here because it's very important. They said, conventional anti-neoplastic approaches will play a role as debulkers. The strategy will change to one of re-regulation. And that is what nutrition does. It re-regulates the body. I'm not against chemo and radiation and surgery. They can debulk the tumor. But in the meantime, you have to change the underlying cause of the disease. And that's what nutrition will help with. So a little cartoon here. Great news, Mr. Hopwood. We got it all. There's nothing left but the head. <laughs> surgery. Remove malignant and target organs. Maybe not the only way we can approach things. I'm in favor of surgery when appropriate. So, a tale of two cancer patients. A uh, patient here, 49-year-old white male diagnosed with advanced multiple myeloma. Therapy was double bone marrow transplant. He had extensive nutrition. I worked with him. Food and supplements. He beat the odds. Six years later, he's still in remission. He got his pilot's license back. He's in pretty good shape. Another patient. 40-year-old white male, same diagnosis, given chemo, thalidomide, and steroids. His doctor said, if you take any nutrition therapy, I won't treat you. He died 18 months after his diagnosis, right on schedule with the data, and that was my brother-in-law, who died with his wife pregnant with twins. One of the reasons I have <clears throat> more passion for this. So... When you look at the data and you say, we're only allowed to do this and we can't do this, but the data says that maybe we should flip the sides. I remember Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Tomorrow? And I think, I 